Let's use I2C with a relatively straightforward chip, the MCP23017. This is an I.O. expander chip. So for instance, our PIC32MX170F uh, 256B has relatively few I.O. pins, and we'll need to dedicate them to things like uh, SPI communication and having crystals and doing uh, special functions like output compare. So we'll quickly run out of simple I.O. pins that we use for buttons and LEDs. An I.O. expander is a chip that takes in, in this case, I2C pins, two I2C pins, and gives us more general purpose I.O. This version of the chip has 16 extra pins. So our I2C bus, which takes two pins, will provide 16, so we will net 14 extra pins. It also has the ability to have settable addresses, and so we can have up to eight of these on the same bus, each providing 16 pins. So we can quickly get lots and lots of pins with this style of chip. Let's take a quick look at the data sheet. So this chip comes in a I2C version and an SPI version. We'll talk about the I2C version. It suggests I2C baud rates of 100 kilohertz up to 1.7 megahertz. Uh, here's the pinout, so we can see the top left of the chip and the top right of the chip have uh, two 8-bit ports, port B and port A. It takes in uh, normal power and ground, and uh, SCK and SDA, those are the data and clock pins for I2C. NC means that those pins are not connected. It has three address pins, we'll talk about what they do. It has a hardware reset and it has two output pins that uh, will tell us if an interrupt is generated. So this style of chip, we can make these pins output pins and turn them on and off, or we can make them input pins and even generate an interrupt when an edge occurs, and they can uh, signal to the microcontroller using the int pins that an interrupt has occurred. We won't use that level of depth in this chip. We'll just make uh, input pins and output pins uh, to control an LED and read a button. Here's what the inside of the chip looks like. Uh, I2C is the input. Notice that the resistors, the pull-up resistors for I2C are not included, so we'll have to build that into our circuit. Um, and then we see we've got all the, uh, the input and output pins over here. Um, this is a chip that uh, is just works with the logic, um, the same as the PIC does. So 3.3 volts. And the first bunch of pages just all about the timing and how fast it can run. Then we get to a table that shows a little more in-depth information about what all the pins do. And then our overview. So the main things uh, we care about here are what are the registers inside of this chip that uh, set the direction of the pins and how do you um, turn the pins on and off or read them. Um, so the names of them are here, I-O der A, I-O der B, so that's the uh, equivalent to the tris on the PIC, so is the pin an input or output. And then towards the bottom of the table, GPIO A and GPIO B, that's if a pin is going to be an input pin. If you read this register, you'll know if a pin is high or low. And then the OLAT A and OLAT B, that's similar to the LAT register on the PIC. Uh, setting a bit there will turn the pin on and off if the pin is an output pin. And then the rest of them have to do with setting up the pin and using interrupts and things like that. We won't go into that kind of detail. An interesting thing, though, is that it's got a register called IOCON and a bit field in there called blank. And if blank is zero, the registers have these addresses. And um, if the bit is one, they have these addresses. So when blank is zero, we see that every register has an equivalent A and B, and they're right next to each other. But if you make bank equal to one, you get all the A's next to each other and then all the B's next to each other. It's kind of like different ways of wanting to use this chip, depending on if you only want the A's or you only want the B's, or if you're going to interleave them. By default, this value is zero, so they are interleaved. So let's take a look at how this data sheet describes the I2C communication. They use this kind of chart, which I'm not a big fan of. Let's go down to uh, like a different version. Here's the device protocol. So we see first you uh, write a start bit, 
and the opcode, that's the part of the address that is fixed. Then you write the address, which is not fixed, using the A pins, and then you would send a write bit. And why I don't like this is this is out of order. It's actually start bit, opcode, address, write bit. Uh, I don't know why they put it in this order. And then if you are just talking to the chip, you'd say send data, send data, send data, and then stop. And if you want it to talk back, you would uh, send the address and some data, and then a restart, and go back and forth. So this is, I don't know, not the most clear uh, method of showing you how the I2C works. Further down, there'll be a, another representation. So the first thing we can know for this chip is what is the address? So after you send a start bit, the address is going to be 0, 1, 0, 0, and then the value is A2, A1, and A0, which are pins. So we can give this chip a unique address. And I would suggest just making those three pins ground so that the address is always 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. It's a 7-bit address, and the 8th bit is reserved for are you trying to read from the chip or write to the chip? And so if you're writing to the chip, that last bit is a 1, and if you're reading from the chip, uh, the last bit um, is, sorry, so if you're writing, it's a 0, and if you're reading, it's a 1. Um, after you do that thing, uh, if you're writing to the chip, the chip will acknowledge, it'll send a bit back to you, and if you're reading, you have to send the chip an acknowledge that says you got it. So let's be sure to write that down. Um, when we're using this chip, we're going to write ourselves a little library, and the first thing we need to know is the address. So we'll have a write address and a read address. And these can be fixed in memory just because we don't have to calculate them on the fly. Um, the write address is always going to be in binary um, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then whatever we make those three A pins, and I would suggest making them a ground. And then if we're writing to the chip, the last bit is always a 0. And if we're reading from the chip, it's the same beginning, but a 1 that tells the chip, hey, I would like to now read from you. Let's keep looking down through the data sheet. So we can see uh, we send a start bit. We send the address with our read or write bit. And in this case, we're writing. The chip will then acknowledge. And then we can start sending more data. So if we want to write to this chip, we will first do a start bit. Then we'll send the address with uh, the write. Um, then we can send the data. And we will do it three times. Um, so the, the, the first time we're sending data is the address. The second time and the third time are telling the chip what we want to do. So this time is the register that we want to change. And the third time is the value that we want that register to take. And that's the maximum um, in this version of the chip. Uh, the the uh, three writes is the most we want to do. So then we'll send the stop bit. So for instance, if we want to tell uh, the uh, uh, A pins to be output, we would have to make sure that the IO dir register um, is set to um, uh, FF. So IO dir is 0x00, that's the value of its register, and then we would set its value to be FF. So if we make all of the, uh, sorry, that would be for inputs. Uh, this register works like tris on the pick. So if we make um, all of the bits inside of the direction zeros, so those pins are outputs. If we want them to be inputs, we would set them all to be uh, ones, so that would be FF. So the way we uh, talk to this chip is we um, send a start bit, we uh, send the address for writing, then we write to it twice, saying I want to change this register to this value, and then a stop bit. The other thing we can do is that we can read from the chip. So if that was writing, here's reading, and it's a little bit more complicated. Um, we do the in, uh, same initial start, so we do a start bit, and then we uh, send the address for writing, and then we send the register that we want to uh, read from. Now we do a restart bit. We send the address 
for reading, that says, okay, Chip, uh, here's what I, I want to read from. Now, hey, Chip, I want to read from you. Now we get a received value. We acknowledge that we got it. And then we can do our stop bit. So reading has this middle part that has a restart, uh, the address for reading, get and acknowledge as many bytes as we're trying to read before we stop. Let's take a look at um, the code that makes this work. I provided uh, a library here that shows um, how we do I2C communication, um, assuming that we're in the polling method, not in the interrupt method, which might be a little faster. So first we always have to call our I2C master setup, and that contains our baud. And then um, we're going to write these two functions, reading and writing. So for writing, we're going to do a start, and then we're going to send the address, send the register, send the value, and then we do a stop. And then for reading, we're going to do a start, uh, send the address um, for writing, send the register we want to read from, do a restart, send the address with reading, then we can uh, receive and acknowledge and then stop. And you can take a look at um, these functions themselves. They're actually relatively straightforward. There's only so many bits. I've temporarily made the baud rate very slow so that we could see it on Nscope if we need to. Later on, you could go and make this faster, maybe 400 kilohertz. And then the other thing I do here is I add an infinite while loop inside of the send command. What that means is that when we try to talk to a chip, uh, the chip, if it receives the data, will acknowledge it. If we don't receive that acknowledgement, we'll go into this infinite while loop and we'll just hang. Um, and that, that's how you can detect that the chip is not in the right phase for talking and that you need to do a power reset. So in your code, you would always be blinking an LED as a heartbeat. And should that LED ever stop blinking, you know that you must be stuck in this infinite while loop. Um, and that, that's usually apparent when your code first starts running. So let's take a look at um, a circuit that has this chip. So I've got my pick up here, and I've got a heartbeat LED that's just telling me that my code is running. And down here is this I, uh, IO expanding chip. And it's a pretty big chip because we're getting an extra 16 pins. Um, if you receive this chip as part of my kit, it probably came in a breadboard like this. And if you want to move it from one breadboard to another, the way I suggest doing that is by using a sharp object to get under the chip, kind of leveraging it up on either side a little bit at a time before pulling it out. If it was all the way in and you attempted to just rip it out with your hand, oftentimes what happens is you, it, it, like one side comes up before the other and you bend all of those pins and then it's hard to get into another breadboard again because all the pins are bent. Um, so be careful when you remove a big chip. It's usually like wedge a little and then wedge a little until it, until it comes out. So back to uh, the way that this circuit is working. Um, I've got my 10K pull-up resistors. I've got my grounds to the A pins, so that the address ends in zeros. Um, I've set the reset pin to 3.3 volts. Um, I could potentially control that reset pin with the pick so that if I detected that my heartbeat wasn't working, I could reset this chip to get I2C to work again. Uh, that's a little problematic because now we're using a whole other pin to talk to this chip, and the whole idea behind I2C was to use only a few pins. Um, so I just hardwired the reset high so that it's never in reset. And then I put a button on uh, B0, and if I push the button, I turn on the LED that's on A7. So the way that the code's working is it's talking to this chip at this rate, saying, is the button pushed? Is it pushed? Is it pushed? If it's not pushed, it's then telling this LED to be off, and if it is pushed, it's telling the LED to be on. And then I'm taking a peek at the I2C lines with my end scope. Um, note that if you've plugged into the N-scope but the N-scope power is not on, that somehow interferes with the I2C communication. So there are resistors and op amps in here that are no longer powered that are now connected to your circuit um, that are interfering with that communication. So um, either don't plug into your N-scope if you're not going to be having the power, or if you do have the power on, um, it might interfere with the chip. So now that the chip is no longer able to work, see my heartbeat isn't on, the best way to restart everything is to kill the power. And that was a very easy way to tell that my chip was no longer in sync and communicating. 